is the same as any other platform, isn't it? Or just real life. There's opportunities to do good and there's opportunities to do bad. And there's plenty of opportunities to misuse it if people are so inclined to do so. My 16-year-old would argue that actually this generation is the most sociable generation ever because they spend more time communicating with more people. But it's easy to feel as though they're being less social because actually the engagement is less face-to-face. -face. Mobile devices have become a very important part of many people's lives. I don't go anywhere without my phone, and I know that it's a huge part of how I stay connected with my parents, with other family, and with my friends. Having a mobile phone means you can communicate with people in ways you never could. You can make new friends in ways you never could, and you can arrange to meet people in ways that I certainly never could when I was a child. So in that respect, it's kind of made us more sociable. The internet is just a tool, it's just a place. Does it encourage people to abuse each other? Of course not, of course not. Does it make it easier to do it? Does it spread the effects? Yes, it does. So you can go on and you can say something to somebody they can't see your face, which I think also it makes people say things that perhaps they wouldn't say in the real world. You might feel a whole lot braver because you're hiding behind the technology, as it were. And it enables big groups together in a way that doesn't really happen offline and that can be fantastic from an activist point of view but also when you're being attacked and bullied online that can be really awful. So what happened to me was that I ran a successful campaign to get female historical figures on banknotes and that turned very quickly um, against me as soon as the campaign was won and I started to receive a lot of rape threats, a lot of death threats and it really went on for about two months with thousands of tweets sent to me threatening to, to kill me. From my perspective, I don't think that that is a product of the internet. I think it's a product of society, and society is reflected in the internet for good or ill. I think what the internet does, perhaps, is it magnifies it. No expression can ever be absolutely free. And I think that um, if I steal your written material and pass it off in my own name, I should be stopped from doing that. Equally, I think that people who are inciting murder as opposed to just being irritating and offensive should be censored. And that's whether they're speaking in public or whether they're writing online. I think these are pretty old, well-established principles and they don't change just because of the, the wonderful innovation and freedom that comes with the internet. It's a shared responsibility, actually. It's partly a responsibility of the people who are using it, but it's also the responsibility of the services that are online in exactly the same way that it's the responsibility of people to use a zebra crossing when they're crossing the road, but it's not their responsibility to paint the zebra crossing on the road. I think it is right to say some kinds of content, like child sexual abuse images, clearly it should be criminal to be producing those because you're causing great damage to children in producing them in the first place and in sharing them. I think it becomes more difficult when you move to these areas such as hate speech. The way to deal with that stuff, which many people would agree is unpleasant, is not to criminalise it but it's actually for other people to, to answer back, to, to point out why it's wrong, to make fun of it and that is more likely to be an effective long-term solution. Material should only be criminalised if, um, if it's causing real harm, not just offence. And that could be child pornography, that could be incitement to violence, not just material that's um, annoying, offensive, disrespectful. Who can possibly be the arbiter of what is good and bad for everyone in the world? It's generally a bad thing to empower an individual to make decisions on behalf of others what content is good and what content is bad. It's very important to realize that when we create rules for how to act on the internet, this should be done in a universal manner. It's very difficult to imagine one person deciding what the code of conduct for how people should act on the internet should be. I think what we would have more success in doing is having these rules um, and obviously policing them but starting further back rather than telling them once they get online that they're not allowed to. What we actually want to do is stop people from doing it in the first place. 
you can make a case that countries should be able to set their own rules. I think the harder question comes when countries say, look, we don't like what this other country is putting online and we want it to stop. But free speech campaigners say, no, we already have quite enough censorship in the offline world. We shouldn't be reproducing that online. The biggest challenge facing governments online, it's probably, Amnesty would say, making sure that they've got the balance right between protecting rights like the freedom of expression and freedom of assembly online and also making sure that their citizens are protected and they're protecting their right to life and their right to be living their lives free from violence. It's not necessarily a balance, the two don't necessarily cancel each other out, but it's working out in this new horizon that's only been around for a very short amount of time where those boundaries lie and doing it properly. But the, the much more important aspect is that computers can't make those decisions. And when you program a filter, you're always taking one individual's interpretation of the subjective judgment and turning it into a fixed law. Making a decision about what's good and bad has to be taken by a human being. It can never be broken down into a sequence of binary steps.